folks. So there's a lot of area in there. Wow. So how many how many of you folks been to Memorial Stadium before? Okay. I'm told that area wise that we can hit we could put 200 memorial stadiums in the area of North Black Bailey Arms. Holy moly! I've never tried that. It's kind of hard to move one of those things, but uh, it's a good I'll comparison. Just take people's word for it. But uh, anyhow, this uh, Bailey Yard was originally established in 1865 by General Grenville Dodge. Uh, really? He was out here scouting the area with the U.S. Uh, Army, looking for, uh, for a place to put a cavalry post. And th at the same time, he was apparently moonlight with Union Pacific, maybe making a couple bucks on the side. And uh, this is where they discovered uh, Bailey Yard was a perfect location. They have a great water source. We're between the North Platte and the South Platte River. So at the time, that was a very important thing because uh, they didn't drill their own water. They needed to get it straight from the rivers. So a perfect location. Um, and also, they discovered, he uh, discovered the uh, area for Fort McPherson, which is a uh, uh, national burial area. Oh, there's a Carmen uh, truck. Right down here by the Gothenburg. So, so what's that? Maxwell, I'm sorry. I got my, I got my towns mixed up again. But uh, anyhow, there was a great location at the time, which it still is now, centrally located within the UP system and pretty much centrally located in the United States. So what, uh, one of the most important things to look to, to, to know is that when you see a train, especially when you see trains like the ones off to your left over here, where they have different kinds of cars all the way through, all the way through them, those are normally what we call manifest trains. Now those manifest trains, they can be hauling everything, anything there, pretty much anything that you have on your person right now, at one point in time was probably on a train. So we haul anything that you can think of on Union Pacific. Well, when you see these trains, all those cars aren't necessarily going to the same location. They don't have the same final destination. So they have to periodically stop at places to get what we call classified or reclassified. And that's what Bailey Yard is. It's a classification yard. We'll take a train that comes in here and once it stops here, that, that train as it is at that point ceases to exist. Look at that. We're going to tear, tear that train apart. Containers. We're going to resort and containers. classify those cars into different uh, rails, what we call the hump system. Then we're going to separate those cars into different rails, and then on the other side of those rails is another crew that's going to start gathering those cars up, doubling them from one rail to another rail to another rail, and making a new train to leave here with different cars on it so they can continue the next step of their journey. So the reason the trains are built the way they are is by classification, that's not... The yeah, the, qu the question is, the reason they're built the way they are is by classification, and that would be correct. You paint on their destination, and, and how those destinations fall in the, in the line of travel for that train is how that those cla those uh, cars are blocked. I don't know if it was for like load stabilization or something like that. So. Well, so, sometimes it is for... for uh, stabilization purposes if you got extremely heavy cars but they're still blocked together right. as much as they can for, by destination but weight weight on a train does play a, a crucial part of how we build these trains so essentially what you meant between so basically a manifest train is a mixture of different types of freight cars just so I get this so I understand and then a unit train is carrying one type of cargo from one destination to another without being classified uh, well, to a degree by and large, that a unit train would be that would be a correct definition. Okay. The, a, a unit train is essentially a train that does not have cars for de different destinations. It makes a, it makes a loop. So it goes from it point has A to point B. One destination and one origin point. Right. So but, there, there's really no reason to classify that train because it, uh, okay. all the cars in there go to the same place. Gotcha. They could be mixed freight. But if they're all going to the same place, that makes it a unit train. Okay, so they don't all have to be the same car, like all coal or all automotive. Basically, if it's a bunch of mixed up cars, but they're all going from origin A to origin B without being broken out of the train, it's a unit. Correct. Okay, that okay, that makes sense. Okay. I honestly didn't know that. Yes. Thank you. Did, anybody, did everybody hear that by chance? Yeah, Where, there, there's two different kinds of trains, uh, for the most huh. part. Unit trains guessed. and manifest trains. Manifest trains are usually trains that have cars that go to several different yep. locations. So those are the ones that we normally classify. Unit trains, although they may have different kinds of cars on it at times, they go to the same destination 
and the, and the same origin points. They just make a loop. They, they don't need to be classified. And we'll talk about what happens to those nice. uh, here in a little bit as we get farther into the tour. Nice job. That's great. Here we go. Into the property. Yes, coal, coal trains are, are, are a example of... Yeah, there's a remote train. set working. So that's... And yeah, if we're... Here recently, Y316. Blocked by a, at a crossing by a coal train. Let me see that probably, uh, switch with the D on it. For commanding, the, controlling the derailleur. That's uh, that is so cool. That is so neat. Man, I I love this yard tour every year. Oh, look at all the wheels over there on that flat car. It's a fresh wheels. Yeah, no kidding. 416 and 316. Okay, our first point of interest uh, that we're going to see here, if you look off to your right, this wheel defect detector. Did some you see of, this? Some of you folks that are yeah. from the local area for North Platte may know this is a, by a different name, but uh, the official name is wheel defect detector. Uh, this is a this is an original, uh, one of a kind uh, facility right here. The only establishment that has this is North Platte, and the reason this came about. Uh, why we have this is back in uh, the, the mid-2000 time period, we were running a lot of coal through Union Pacific. And we were starting to come down with an issue of uh, micro-fractures on steel wheels. And micro-fractures are fractures that even the most skilled carman uh, is not going to be able to, to detect no matter what. And it was starting to cause some problems, and uh, so to combat these problems, they came up with this building that uses a series of uh, X-ray, infrared, and uh, uh, ultrasound technology to examine the wheels of the train. So we would pull a train through there at five miles an hour, and all the wheel sets on that train would get would get uh, evaluated, and a report would be sent back to either the mechanical forces if it was a locomotive, or car forces if, if it was a car, and they would. Uh, identify what cars need to, or what wheel sets need to be changed out. So essentially that defect detector is basically like an industrial equivalent of like getting like an x-ray for your body? Yes, for the wheels? A, a mega x-ray machine for trains. That's a good way of putting it. That's pretty impressive. So the, the, the bad, the, well not really the bad part, but we only used that facility for a short while and uh, the, the, then we didn't stop using it. And the reason being because the technology that we were able to, to get from developing that now gives us the ability to do the same thing on the main lines with trains that are moving 60 miles an hour over the track. So instead of slowing one train down at a time, five miles per hour, and taking maybe up towards the 30 minutes to get through that thing, now we can just have it sit right through it. And it does the exact same thing. So, yes, sir. What would happen if a wheel had a, cr a big crack on it, if it's cracked in half? Yeah. Well, hopefully it's not moving because it would be a mess after that. Oof, that'd be messy. So. <coughs> now, are the cars empty when they do that? No, no, you said they're going down. They, yeah, they, 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 it doesn't It doesn't matter whether they're empty or loaded, it'll do the same thing. So then you can find what they have the effects. Do you have to remove it from the train or can you? Real good question. What do we when we find a wheel with a defect? Do we have to remove the car from the train? Most times the answer is no. Uh, what we can do that's what this facility over here, the wheel shop or the, the one stop spot is uh, their job is. You see a, a lot all these wheel sets out here. We average changing about ten thousand wheel sets a year here. Really, the tire shop. And in all honesty, it takes them about as much time to change change all the wheels on a car as it does for you to take the lug nuts off of your pickup. <laughs> wow. It, it's real quick. Forklift up, wheels out, new wheels in, forklift down, you're done. Are they working NASA too? They, not NASA, they, they, NASCAR. NASCAR. They, they might. They actually, I mean, they'd probably be pretty good at it. Yes, sir. It actually, from what I had learned from one of the volunteers at the tower, they had actually had told me that the guys that work on swapping wheel sets had actually talked with NASCAR pit crews to figure out how to do it quicker 
to figure out how to do the wheel right, changes out yeah, much and, faster. And you, you're exactly right. We did have at one time, we had, we did have advice. We, we consulted with NASCAR pit crews <laughs> for, for the wheel changing to, to, to come up with a proficient system of doing it. And we also did that at the run throughs for the exact same purpose to facil to uh, facilitate moving our unit trains. So yes, we do. We consult with whoever's the best at what they got and what they do to make our better. operation more proficient. I don't think you can get better than NASCAR. Yeah, that one spot facility back there, although they do change an incredible amount of wheel sets every year, they can also do any kind of work that needs to be done with it, with any kind of car. They can they can do structural work. They can uh, repair air 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 systems, uh, which you know, air brakes on, on on the cars. They can do body work, anything like that. So that's basically like a diesel shop for the cars. Exactly, that's a like, like a diesel shop for the cars. They can do just about anything that needs to be done to a car. So what happens with old wheels once you take them off? Do they get recycled and made into new wheels, or do they just get scrapped? Okay, old. What happens to old wheels? Old wheels uh, normally uh, they they're reforged, so we reuse them. We'll, we send them from here. You probably if you travel the interstates a lot. You've probably seen flatbed trailers with tons of rail wheels on them. Oh yeah. We yeah, they're incredibly expensive just to throw them away once they're once they're done. So they get reforged, and they get new bearings put in, and they are basically they're rebuilt, and they come back here. Now the wheels on a locomotive, they'll oftentimes they'll 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 put them through a trim machine at the diesel shop, and they'll make them round again. Yeah. Because a lot of times what happens, you know, when you have steel wheels on steel rails, a lot of times what happens is those wheels get a little bit out of round. And just traveling and traveling and traveling and next thing you know they're almost oval sometimes you'd be in that locomotive and you're literally bouncing around i mean it's not fun so they'll put them on this trim machine it's just a big grinder and it'll grind them so around again and then they have a certain tolerance to where they can do that so many times before they have to be shipped off so isn't it with like freight trains like if you slam it into emergency can't that be also a cause for making flat spots because the wheels essentially would lock up and then yes. slide against the rail. But putting a train in an emergency will cause flat spots on steel wheels really fast. And isn't it, from what I've heard, isn't it you can't let the flat spot, according to railroad rules anyway, the flat spot can't get any bigger than the size of a credit card? And then, uh, actually, I think it's a little smaller than that. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I, like, I had yeah, heard that from somebody. It's like two inches. Okay, that's it's probably tall. more accurate. I couldn't remember where I heard that. <laughs> Maybe just sideways. Yep. Okay. So we were talking a little bit earlier about what, what happens to these manifest trains when we classify these trains. Um, we utilize the hump system. And what the hump is, it's just a, it's just a hill. And what we'll do is we'll shove that train up, up, the top, up to the top of the hill. And once those cars get to the top, up to the apex of that hill, there's an electronic board out there that tells the trainman how many cars he needs to send at that particular time. One, two, three, or four cars. So he can either send one car down at a time, or the main trump at, or hump at track, and as it goes down, it branches out. So there's the loader. One yep. one track becomes two, two becomes four, and, and then exponentially branches out from there. Yep. Over there's here at the one. west hump, we have 50 tracks over there where it branches into. The east hump, which is a little bit bigger, we have 64 tracks that it branches into. Everything so each one of those tracks window. is a destination yep. for, for those cars. There it's it is, right over there. And there's that little tower so, that we can see from the is, window. Once they pull those down, now those cars. And then here's yes, their the rip department. A bit through gravity, because it's pulling those cars so down. That this hill. track in here is the rip uh, department. We don't yeah. just let Mother Nature take over and let those cars go and forget about it. I mean, you know, all that, all that, all those uh, crystal glasses in there and things like that. <laughs> probably don't like that kind of treatment. I'm sure. Nope. So, what we do is once those cars are let down the hill. They are mod their speed is monitored the entire way down. No, we, no, no. The, what becomes important at that particular time, this is all done by a computer, is what we call distance to come. Oh. So it's measured how far it is from the, when that car is coming down the hump as to how far it has to go into its destination rail till it meets the next car in that rail. And that distance is measured, and the weight of that There's car, and the inertia is generating, yep. the speed is, OTP. is all taken into account. And the no, goal is, is that's that's an active OTP. that they car, that cut of cars no. beats the next that's car on that rail, that they couple up at no greater than two miles. Oh, look! Trackmobile! So we oh, that, that, that is awesome! Speed. So we control I don't think I'd ever seen one in person. 
I'll get right with you, sir. That is so cool. Uh, I didn't realize you'd be any of those. The best way to describe the retarder is imagine that is a so steel cool. disc like this. You take a pair of pliers. Oh, that's like neat. That. Stop it. But magnify I that by a million. Had, that's I didn't realize they had track mobiles in this yard. Imagine, it makes a little bit of sound on the way down. Just about, yeah. So, yeah. If Hopper you don't car. Not like figure drills on a chalkboard, you will not like retarders. I promise yeah. you. Oh, yeah. And if we get the chance on the way back, uh, we're going to get up close and personal with some retarders. Sweet. So everybody can experience what I experienced years ago. That's why I have to talk so loud. I've experienced it, and they are really loud. And you're no, but they, it's an it is, it is very interesting thing to see. It really is. You're not wrong about the sound, though. They do sound like nails on a chalkboard. So, There's a cool view of the east. Sir, do you have a question back? Yeah. Is this retarder process is that automatic or manual? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Does a person control the retarder, or is it computer? Does? Well, yeah. The it's it. The retarders are all controlled electronic or via computer now. Uh, actually, they have been for quite a few years. Now, we can still manually operate those retarders if we need to. You can hear them. But it's all done by a computer screen. Yeah, you can hear them squeaking. And if need be, if for whatever reason we need to stop a car or cut a car on the way down, we can stop them in their tracks. So no matter how heavy that car is, we can stop them. Do you have another question, sir? If they're doing what now? Well, yeah. If they if they actually have happen to meet um, a little harder than what we want, if they slam into each other, oftentimes what will happen is is that that original distance to couple might have changed because the the car that they're they're measuring off of started rolling back towards them. So that I don't think that's ever taken into account. So that distance shortened. So we can't control the speed quite so well at that point. Did you have a question, ma'am? <laughs> wow. This reminds me of Cumberland Terminal on Trent right. <laughs> Yes. Yes, back, back in the day when they used to have a li uh, lady up here just gave a story. There, we used to have a, a driving movie theater tanks. out here by Highway 30. <laughs> and the, the retarders used to drive, uh, drown out the sound of the uh, to, to the driving theater once in a while. I don't know. Before it was all computerized, how did you control it? Before it was computerized, it was all by your eyes. There, we had retarder operators up in a tower who would just use their eyes and their common sense. I need to slow this one down, we need to drop the retarders, give us more speed. And yeah, he was right. But they were good at what they did. I mean, they really were. Okay, now we were talking about unit trains here a little while ago. This facility off to our right, is what we call our eastbound fueling facility or, or east run through. This facility here is built to expedite the movement of these unit trains since they don't have to be classified and usually they're, they're more of a premium type uh, train so they're, they're, we want to get those the movement of that train expedited. What happens here is these unit trains will come into the run through facility and once the, the outbound crew ties that train down, ties the tan brakes, secures the train, they get off. Well, the mechanical forces and car forces can jump on there. They can refuel the locomotives on there. They can inspect the air brakes. They can do light maintenance on the locomotives. They can re-sand them with a whole ball of wax. Get everything ready to go so the outbound crew can jump on there, knock the brakes off, and away they go. So the big difference, just for an example, is oftentimes a train will spend about four, you know, three to five hours, maybe a little bit more at the run through before from the time it stops to the time it, it gets going again. Whereas opposed to most of your manifest trains, well, for the time they get stop in North Platte to the time they're going again is 12 to 24 hours on average. Yeah, and that's a, that's probably a time we're constantly trying. A lot of like times it's less than that. Sometimes it's more. Yeah, this is where the trucks come to get their fuel. Well, they had to get locomotives. If you count a locomotives at Bailey Yard at any given time, here's another one. we will usually here's the ones you can see throughout the course of a day, inbound, outbound, and state. We'll run about 700 locomotives through here. Yep. Yeah, these Our are all fuel the fuel tanks over here. Uh, Long-term fuel over there in the white one. This uh, fuel tank over here is uh, our daily sink. This is where fuel is actually drawn out of 
That's reserve fuel in the white one. Uh, we have our diesel fuel pumped in here uh, through by a pipeline. It's, there's really no other practical way of getting as much fuel as we need here. And isn't it for the fueling system you guys use for locomotives that are working within the yard, such as the switchers, you guys, don't you refill those using the fuel trucks instead of having to bring them to an actual fuel rack to fill them up? Well, it, it depends on what needs to be done with the switches. The, the question was, why? essentially, why, what do we use the fuel trucks for? Yeah, okay. yeah, basically. The, the fuel trucks, sometimes they'll be used to refuel up the switchers. Sometimes the switchers go to the fueling rack to get refilled. Uh -huh. If they need some maintenance or some inspections done with them, we'll put them on the fuel racks. Okay. okay. Uh, the, the fuel trucks will come out for the switchers. The fuel trucks are also used for what we call distributed power units or DPUs. Oh. If you guys have ever seen the trains where you'll have one or two locomotives on the head end, that. maybe one or two in the middle, a couple on the end, those those units that are not on the head end are called distributed power units. Oh, okay. Now those are locomotives that the engineer on the head end can control however he wants to. He can do what we call put a fence up and he can have those locomotives mirror image everything he's doing on the head end. So anything yeah, he does, those the rails are gonna do. Yeah. Or he can run each one of those locomotives us. independently of the head end. He can be putting more power in, on the middle of the train and putting some brakes on the end while he's putting more power on the head end. It depends on the terrain they're running on. So Sometimes they need to do different setups for different terrain they're running on so they can control what we call the in-train forces inside, inside of the train. So essentially, if like the train's climbing over a hill, all the locomotives will be basically pushing, and then once it crests over the top, the front head end power would say start going into dynamic, while the rear DPUs are still pushing the rest of the train up. Yeah, you got, that's a pretty good handle. And then on it, as yeah. they crest over the top, then they'll switch over into dynamic to start slowing it down. So yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Now, front, this is a pretty good position right here to actually get a unique view that you don't normally get anyplace else. You actually get to see a whole coal train from the top. Wow, that's incredible. This is where we saw Big Boy last year. Yeah. This is where he came in last year. <laughs> Look right there. Yeah. Now this is a pretty good vantage point. Uh, th now keep in mind, this coal train here that you see, although it looks pretty big right now, uh, oftentimes when this thing's getting ready to depart, we're gonna double it up with another coal train of equal or greater size that's the thing before that's it leaves here. So that happens quite often. The um, now we were talking when we first started our tour. We were talking about how how we're eight miles from east to west on this thing. If you can see the water tower all the way down there uh, on your right hand side, okay, that is, that is our eastern yard limit. Okay, our our western yard limit is this Dex Bridge that you see off here on your left hand side. Wow. So that's your eight miles right there. That gives a good example of just how big this place is. Yeah. Holy if you're smokes. Dreaming, like I am by craft, you've walked every inch of this place. So. <laughs> you definitely got your steps in. Well, I think it's actually it's it's uh, the the original land grant for Union Pacific for Bailey Yard was actually quite a bit bigger than it is now. I always think it's funny so how it's there's actually a little got, sign and it, I think track, technically, and it's like, and it's like why is it still probably to read this? most of our flat? And yeah, if you're close enough to read this, throw that train into emergency and stop. It's just that the, the, what we need to use is much, much smaller. This is that amazing. I'm loving this. Railroad's huge. Look at that, all the piggybacks. Either side of the tracks. Look at the piggybacks and containers out there. I don't know how that works. This is uh, wild. If you, if you have really detailed questions like that, a great place to go is the uh, County Historical Museum. Uh, go talk to Jim down there. He's the curator. That guy knows more about history of Lincoln County and Union Pacific than you'll ever be able to shake a stick at. <laughs> Tomorrow they have a pork and corn feed, and that is something you want to get. Keep that in mind. Okay, now this building you see up here to the left, this brown building, this is actually not a Union Pacific building. This is uh, originally, it was built by General Electric. Oh, this is the GE And so uh, I, I believe General Electric, or at least their locomotive division, uh, was sold out to a company called Wabco or Wabtec or something like that. It was Wabco. Wabco, there we go. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole purpose of this building is, is back, we, like we were stating earlier, uh, we, we were running a lot of coal through Union Pacific back in the uh, wow. mid-2000s. 
uh, we were buying lots of brand new locomotives. And just like when you buy a brand new car, there's certain wow. things that only the dealer yep. can do to that car. Oh yeah. Just like locomotives. Well, the problem at that time was is we used to have to send those locomotives down to North Little Rock, Arkansas. And we would lose those locomotives for 30, sometimes 90 days, maybe even more, depending on what Here's the run through. Well, you know, it's a part of it anyway. The railroad kind of feels that way area. like you would if you, you know, lost your brand new Silverado for 90 days so they can replace a bolt. Yeah. You know, you'd be a little upset too. Well, when you pay two and a half billion dollars for a locomotive and then you have to send it away for 90 days so they can change a screw, you know, that kind of irritates you a little bit. Just a little. So, General Electric at the time built this building up here to do that warranty work and warranty maintenance work and basically cut that from 90 plus days down to just a couple of days of loss. So this it is, is still unbelievable. Today. I'm getting all kinds of good. I'll be trimming it up, of course, for different areas. Yes. You said it's known by something else by the local. Correct. I did, I did say that, but I just didn't tell you what it was. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, the common name for that wheel defect detector is uh, we, we affectionately call it the crack house. <laughs> now, luckily, uh, unfortunately, last year I had a couple that was on here that really took that to be literally. And Jeez. Some pretty coined oh, questions see. about what they sell in the crack house. Oh, were they dating? Oh, and, oh. And, they were something, and you know, I, I, I kind of had this come down to the point where I told them, I don't think crack house means what you think it means. So. And I think it just clicks for me what you mean by that, because they'd find the cracks in the wheels. Correct. Right. <laughs> it took me a few seconds to figure that one out after you said it. I'm like, yeah, oh, you guys are supposed you to see the Area 51 now. Now the guys in black are going to have to come talk to y'all. <laughs> I remember this from yeah, last look, year. Look. Please look into this device here, this classy thing. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I remember this from last year. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You know what? My story hasn't changed either. All right. <laughs> Let's see if I'll uh, compare area, it to area the footage 51, from last year. Um, the official uh, reason we call this Area 51 is because uh, there was a day, and I don't know exactly when this was, but I can imagine it was probably about 2005 or six. Uh, we were able to process 51 coal trains uh, in one day through this facility. Wow! That's the official position. Look at that! That's their whole story, and they're sticking yeah. to it. It's, it's like a service. Well, those of us that work in this yard yeah, have servicing a whole There's some service units working there, working on the switches. There's but, a front yeah. loader moving. Anyhow, loader. Area 51. Loader. This is what that building right there is where uh, basically all your managers from this facility, uh, their offices at. You have your yard masters oh. in there. And okay. the yard master, he or she is in charge of all movement in this, in this particular yard here. Working on switches. Uh, so nothing moves without them giving the approval to it. So that's basically where the head honcho sits to yeah, manage this whole honcho. place. As a, as a trainman, you really want to stay out of that place. Yeah, if you go <laughs> in there, you might have but, some uh, explaining to do. But just like the Area 51 you know, and the, that doesn't exist in the Nevada desert, there's a lot of strange things that may or may not happen in that building especially decisions that are made that we just kind of find questions about. That's, that's the unofficial version of it. That's the principal's office. So if you were <laughs> I like that. The principal's office of the train yard. Yeah, I, I, I call in sick and sound. Good. <laughs> okay, now if, <laughs> if you look off to your right, that the intermodal. That was cool. I'm going to have to just trim, I'm going to have to trim this up. That's easy enough to do anyway. And then put, trim it up as necessary. I'll probably be doing this for the next few hours. I'll probably be up late tonight working on it. Okay, There's now looking up, uh, a big, uh, a huge safety factor for your train crews, and actually not even just your train crews, but all railroad workers that work out in the field. If you look off here to your right, you, you've probably seen these all over the yard so far. Little stands, they have a little flag on there that says safety first, maybe a, a light up there, and, that, and a little yellow thing that's the track. Well, that, that yellow thing is called a derail. Once you throw that handle, that thing pops up on top of the track, and it's got a little angle to it. So if any locomotive or car happens to come through there, it hits that, it diverts it off the track, and puts it in the dirt to stop the car from going any further. Isn't that's, it? Uh, we use those if you have uh, mid, mid or, 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 or we've been working on our equipment, like at this uh, fueling facility over here. On the track. 
Okay, excellent question. What does it take to get a locomotive on a track after it goes over one of those derails? We have two really big guys out here. And they, <laughs> Doesn't it no. work? That's all they do. <laughs> That's all they do. There's a big off-road the four, four, four-wheel drive telehandler, not telling their uh, scissor lift. <laughs> now we uh, we we do have a crane out here, uh, or actually a couple of them that are called a Manus, a uh, huge, very heavy uh, heavy. This has been yes, yes. That this uh, the, oh uh, look at that on the, on the west end of these trains. Yeah. Track the crane. Guy who's controlling. <laughs> it's one of those rail cranes. I saw that one earlier. See how he's got that little grabber? And he's trying to... <laughs> exactly. Do you see what he's trying to... He's trying to grab it. Maybe mom should grab Yes, ma'am. The guy pulling the pin spends all day stepping up and over the rail, or does he have a... bar or something? No, he's, he, he just sits on... He walks on a pathway, just makes a little loop. About a four-car loop. And depending on how many cars he, he needs to let down at the time, You'll either let one at a time, two, three, or, or up to four. So he just, pull he, just, he just pulls the pin and turns around and walks it walks back. But and he'll, a, he'll look at a board, there's a, there's a dashboard up there. It'll tell him what his next cut's going to be, how many cars it is. Okay, call brake lines, how do you get They uh, automatically the unhook. The brake lines also automatically? Yeah, the brake lines are just little uh, uh, angle cut or uh, glad, glad hands. hands. They'll just pop right off. That, when they get under a certain amount of pressure, they'll just separate the engine. Yep. And you know, with the glad hands as well, you're not supposed to uncouple them when they're under pressure. Because if you pop the glad hands apart while they're under pressure, there's enough force behind them with the yeah, air. Yeah, so once those trains are, all these trains over here that you hurt. see on your right hand side, those are all trains getting ready to go over these humps sometime today. Yeah, if you're up in the Golden Spike, if you look past the East Hump Hill, you can see this yard. Now here's here our fuel the trucks we were discussing earlier. These fuel trucks, they, they, they refuel a lot of our switchers. Uh, they they fuel most of our DPUs that are out there. This is the rack. This is where they get their fuel from. Is this rack off to the right here? So you had said that the fuel comes into this giant white tank, and then whatever, and then it gets transferred into that blue tank, and whatever's in that blue tank is used for filling up stuff throughout the from the tanker trucks. Yeah, that's for that's where the fuel's drawn from. Okay. This is a reserve tank. That's so the there's the tanks. so the there the big. So that's the emergency reserve tank, the big white one or the blue one? I'm trying to remember. The white one. The white one. Got it. So basically, if you're running low, you'd switch over from the blue tank to the white tank, and then you'd have enough fuel for maybe a day or so, probably. I couldn't tell how long it lasts. Probably goes down pretty quick. It, I, I do know that years ago we used to refill that blue one up every day. No oh, jeez. Oh, wow. So that wouldn't last yeah, you long when, now. When we were running lots of cold through here, about. Uh, 2005, 6, 7, like that. We were refilling that thing every day. Two million gallon One's a little more, one's a little less. It's kind of like it's basically the I'm combination of the two tanks yeah, we see at North. By, by grab, I'm a Swiss one and a half million. Uh, and a I have been for the past several years yeah, working on this. They call it Pear Trader. I helped train new hires. Uh, I show them do a lot of mentoring work. Uh, set up for uh, all the job training out here in the yard. Uh, I help them get used to water life. Things like that. Shift-wise, if you're working in the yard, the shifts are scheduled for eight hours, so it's three eight-hour shifts. Now keep in mind, the trainman out here at Bailey Yard, this is a 24-hour, 365-day operation. We don't stop operations for anything, holidays, storms, tornadoes, I mean, you name it. And we don't stop operations for anything. Would the weather well, have whatever to... Whatever happens, okay. you know, we're going to be in it. 100 degree weather, we're in it. 100 below zero, we're in it. Would the weather have to get really... Yes, sir. You got a question? Oh, How many switches are in the yard? Oh, my. I don't know the exact number. Last last number I had was like 279. So basically, for the operation of this yard, no matter what, unless the weather gets really, really, really severe, it's pretty much 24-7, 365 days operation. No, that's incorrect. Uh, we would work no matter what. No matter what? Tornadoes, volcanoes, asteroids, oh, alien invasions. Jeez, uh, it seems irritated like irritated spouses. I mean, we'll work for everything. It seems like with a tornado, it, it seems like that would be the limit because that'd be. It seems like that'd do a tornado. lot of damage. Air Force One. Oh, I know okay. these. Basically, it's a jet engine on wheels that oh, we can run over switches and it yep, generates going under the hump. Lots of thrust. There's the tower. Blow snow and ice out of the out of switches. So it's basically like and a glorified leaf And then we have brand new trainmen, new hires and stuff with rooms. 
you got those guys too. And so essentially, so th this is where seniority really plays a part in what we do out here. So. Oh, that's a that's a dumpster truck. Oh, they're working on the retarder. Okay. Yes, sir. How many miles of track you have in the yard? I miles of track we have right about uh, 300 miles of track. I thought it was 40. So, and that might that might vary one way or another because we've added some track here recently. So I don't know what the, where they added it and how much they did, but uh, on average it's close to 300 miles. So you can get yourself from here to Omaha pretty easy on, on what we got here at the yard. Okay, now coming up here, we're going to get a good good shot at the bowl, and we'll be able to see some the returners. Unfortunately, it looks like they're doing some kind of maintenance up there at the hump, so they're, we're not going to be able to see anything going down. But you'll get a good shot at the bowl and uh, kind of see how the bowl's laid out. And there is a, a set of retarders that we did remove last year, so you actually get to get real close to see how those things operate. And, and like I said, they're just like a big pair of pliers. Yeah. And too bad we're not going to be able to hear them because I think you guys would really enjoy that. So <laughs> isn't it for the bowl? It's not a perfectly flat. The bowl's not perfectly flat. No, it's kind of. It's called a bowl. It's kind of sloped, like a big like saucer. A yep. Huh. That way you, you don't have to worry about it rolling out. They'll, they'll always congregate in the center. Okay, that makes sense. How long will the set of retarders last? So here's the retarder modules. That's what they look like. Uh, actually, these are the first ones I've ever seen replaced. Oh. So wow. now there's there's bales on there. The actual look at that. Compressors or brakes, so to speak. They replace those quite often, but the actual retarders themselves. Yeah, you can I see think, the springs. Really yeah. So basically, the retarders. Yeah, these are the retarders here you see on your left hand like side. And then the functioning yeah. ones are right on the other side. There's so two sets of them. These are what they call uh, the that's primaries. That's cool. Or no, these are the secondaries. The primary. That's ones really cool what they look like. I like that. So don't the retarders kind of work like a glorified brake shoe, and they just grab onto no, the actual? Like, like I said, they're just like a big pair of pliers. They grab it, they squeeze onto them. Yeah. They squeeze the wheel, yeah. and that slows them down. Disc brakes would be a better better way of looking at them. Yeah, okay, kind of like brakes on a car. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was kind of trying and to explain. Here's your bulb checks. You can see how they're just each each rail is a separate destination. Now, that if you is... look around, you see the blue pipes and the blue cylinders around. So you know that picture now, all this, everything that happens out here, all from these, this, all these like, switches, you know that turns, picture they're like, painted on the inside that's of the not, tower. That's not electricity. That was shot the from the top it's, of the East Hump. Uh, pneumatic. It's all air power. Oh. Okay, so needless to say, you can't just go down to go down to Menards and buy a 33-gallon air compressor and no. expect <laughs> you're going to run these. That's up. not going to work. So we we do have have a special facility for that. And if you look over here on your right, you'll see these, these big blue containers, those blue coils and everything. That building when I first hired on, and, uh, it's awesome. about eight or ten years ago, it finally collapsed on itself or something. We decided it's probably best not to use it anymore. Because the building yard is so large, do they have one master control center or do they have a series of three controls that are on it? Well, with the, set, the question was, is do we have a centralized control uh, center here or a, is it decentralized? And the, the, the answer is it's centralized. Uh, if you look, when you're over at the spike, if you look just off to this direction here, and a little bit to the east, you see a big ground building there. Great big uh, microwave tower out, out on the east side. That's the yard office. That's where the uh, general manager, the superintendents, and uh, a lot of managers happen to be in that building. So that's your command center. There's the diesel the shop. So any, that's big, pretty much where uh, everything happens in that building. It affects the yard light anyhow. It's cool listening to the cars. Okay, our locomotive repair facility. <laughs> this is the largest in the UP system, and possibly in, in, uh, in the United States. Um, we, we process, on average, we can process about 75 locomotives per day through there. Wow, so And this high? facility could do anything to a locomotive outside of warranty work that needs to be done. They can replace uh, the diesel engines. They can replace the uh, uh, electric generator fields. They can replace traction motors. Uh, pretty much anything that needs to be done, they can do. Structural work, body work, you name it. And then you can also check the oil once in a while, too. So they can basically do just about anything yeah. to a locomotive except for replacing the entire engine. No, I, 
you know, we, 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 we usually get about 750 yeah. locomotives through here in a day. So that's, that's inbound trains, outbound trains, trains for maintenance, things like that. I love this as we go by. Does that tell the series, age, and all that? The identifier numbers on a locomotive tell you what series that, that locomotive is. Does that also tell you what the output maximum output? No, it really doesn't It doesn't really have uh, any bearing on your output. Yes, ma'am. Why do we sometimes see BNSF and Norfolk Southern locomotives connected to UP locomotives? Why do we get BNSF and, uh, and Norfolk Southern locomotives? Because they can't handle their own stuff. <laughs> so we have to do it for them. <laughs> no, we... Uh, Railroads oftentimes uh, utilize, sometimes they have to travel over our tracks to get to, uh, to fulfill contracts, vice versa. Because you'll see lo UP locomotives on BNSF, and sometimes even if you go down and CSX. It's going to swing around and back into the dock. Look at this. Unusual. We'll see it's big fans. Look at that, but, fan uh, modules. Yeah. Yeah. But it uh, doesn't happen very often, but you do see it. Wow. Yes, sir. You're going to have to start, I can't hear a word. Sorry. It looks like you've seen a lot of Norfolk Southerns hooked up to UPs lately. Is that just a fluke of timing, or is that like a business change you guys have? Well, you know, a lot of the old heads uh, tell me that when you start seeing a lot of another railroad's locomotives, that you're probably going to end up merging here before too long. Yeah, the power's But I don't know how true that is because is... I've been seeing a lot of those NS local loaders for several wow, years. Wow, North Platte dude. I don't know so if it's look just at, luck of the draw or what the case, or they're just using our lines for a lot of things. I no, really don't know. Work in this yard. That'd be but, yeah, awesome. I, I, I agree. We do see a lot of them though. I was wondering with as many locomotives as the shop here puts through in a day, I mean, as many as y'all see. Why would they? Uh, why has? Why haven't they seen about making the uh, technicians and mechanics uh, warranty certified operators, where they could do the warranty work without having to send it out? Wow, that's a question. <laughs> that, that is a tough one. There's a guy in Omaha named Lance what? Fritz. That, uh, Give me a cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, why they don't do. You know, it, it would seem to me to make sense why we can't have our own mechanics. And machinists do warranty work on locomotives. I mean, it, it would seem like it's common sense, wow. but I'm sure I don't know why. I don't have a good answer for you. It's above your pay grade. Way yeah. above my pay grade. Yeah. Wow, look at that. If I was making that decisions like that, I steel. promise you, I would not be here today. Yeah. So. They put you up in a higher but, position. But you know what? I'm, I would rather be here than up there. Oh yeah. Sure. Wow. This is awesome. So how long have you? Worked? How long have I worked for UP? Well, I hired on in 1998. There's a yard so, engine. That's what, 20, BY 718. Well, I'm, I'm, my craft, I'm a trainman. So I'm a switchman, conductor. UPY 649. Uh, most of my career, I've been working in training like I'm doing now. UPY 722. Who else we got? Like today. Yeah. So, uh, how you ended up on the bus today? Uh, well, you know what? I, I this really is so my, cool. I enjoy being on the bus. It's an easy day. No, it's not an easy day. This is just so darn cool. <laughs> no, I, I enjoy coming out here and getting I bus know. tours. And uh, I enjoy uh, answering questions with people. And because this, this is a fast yep, place. Oh, yeah. It really is. And, and the more I can share with people, uh, the better you know, the better off everything is for everybody around. Yes, I from a standpoint, I mean, just well, the one, yeah, the one place that we didn't get to talk to, speaking of logistics, uh, we do have a supply operations building back there. You know, it's not really practical for us if we, because here in Bailey, if we need It's not, I didn't shut it off yet. We most likely need a thousand. I shut that one down because so it was just really building over there. For us to go to Walmart and buy it. Yeah, I'm waiting until we're, I'm waiting until we pull back into the Golden Spike before I shut down this lower one. So, and there's really no place in the state of Nebraska or anywhere close to us that we can just go out and get what we need when we need it. So we have a military or a supply operation that's run a lot like a military supply depot is. And then anything we need here in the area, whether it's pencils, whether it's water, uh, anything we need, locomotive engines, turbochargers, you name it, it comes through supply. We, there are remote control vests, hearing protection, eye protection, gloves, all that comes from supply. So that's how big this, this is like its own city, it really is. 
And it's, it, like I said, it's a fascinating place to work. It's a fascinating place to see. The D we on it. There a little bit longer the, down controlling the derailleur. Years ago. That's, and, uh, that is so you, the, cool. I think they're probably going to get longer yet. <laughs> that is so neat. Man, I, I love this yard tour every year. Oh, look at all the wheels over there on that flat car. Fresh wheels. Yeah, no kidding. 416 and 316. Okay, our first point of interest uh, that we're going to see here, if you look off to your right, this wheel defect detector. Some, see of, this? some of you folks that are from the local area for North Platte may know this is by a different name. But uh, the official name is wheel defect detector. Uh, this is a this is an original uh, one of a kind uh, facility right here. The only plate establishment that has this is North Platte. And the reason this came about, uh, why we have this, is back in uh, the, the mid 2000 time period, we were running a lot of coal through Union Pacific, and we were starting to come down with an issue of uh, micro fractures on steel wheels. And micro fractures are fractures that even the most skilled carman uh, is not will be able to, to detect no matter what. And it was starting to cause some problems. And uh, so to combat these problems, they came up with this building that uses a series of uh, X-ray, infrared, and uh, uh, ultrasound technology to examine the wheels of the train. So we would pull a train through there at five miles an hour, and all the wheel sets on that train would get would get uh, evaluated. And a report would be sent back to either the mechanical forces if it was a locomotive or car forces if, if it was a car and they would de uh, identify what cars need to, or what wheel sets need to be changed out so essentially that defect detector is basically like an industrial equivalent of like getting like an x-ray for your body yes for the wheels a, a mega x-ray machine for trains that's a good way of putting it that's pretty impressive so the, the, the bat, the, well, not really the bad part, but we only used that facility for a short while, and uh, then, we, then we didn't stop using it. And the reason being because the technology that we were able to, to get from developing that now gives us the ability to do the same thing on the main lines with trains that are moving 60 miles an hour over the track. So instead of slowing one train down at a time, five miles per hour, and taking maybe up towards the 30 minutes to get through that thing, now we can just have it sit right through it. And it does the exact same thing. So, yes, sir. Well, so I have a question. What if, uh, what if uh, one uh, wheel car, like, uh, like that on the wheel car, what if it was cracked and have a defect? What would happen if it had a crack on it? What would happen if a wheel had a, a big crack on it? If it's cracked in half? Well, hopefully it's not moving because it would be a mess after that. That'd be messy. So, <coughs> so are the cars empty when they do this? No, no, you said that you're going down. Yeah, they, 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 it doesn't, like, it doesn't what, matter what, whether they're empty or loaded. It'll do the same thing. So then, decide the what they have to do to remove it from the train, or can you like replace the wheel while it's there, loaded, and attached? Real good question. When we, when we find a wheel with a defect, do we have to? remove the car from the train most times the answer is no uh what we can do that's what this facility over here the wheel shop or the, the one stop spot is uh their job is you see a, a lot of all these wheels out here we average changing about ten thousand wheel sets a year here in the entire shop and in all honesty it takes them about as much time to change it change all the wheels on a car as it does for you to take the lug nuts off of your pickup. <laughs> wow. It, it's real quick. Forklift up, wheels out, new wheels in, forklift down, you're done. Are they work at NASA too? They, not NASA, they, they, NASCAR. They, 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 they might. They actually, I mean, they'd probably be pretty good at it. I'd probably try it out. Yes, sir. And actually, from what I had learned from one of the volunteers at the tower, they had actually had told me that the guys that work on swapping wheel sets had actually talked with NASCAR pit crews to figure out how to do it quicker to figure out how to do the wheel right, changes out yeah, much and, faster. And you, you're exactly right. We did have at one time, we had, we did have advice. We, we consulted with NASCAR pit crews <laughs> for for the wheel changing to, to, to come up with a proficient system of doing it. And we also did that at the run throughs for the exact same purpose to, facil to uh, facilitate moving our unit trains. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do, we consult with whoever's the best at what they got 
at what they do think to make our better. operation more proficient. I don't think you can get better than NASCAR. Yeah, that one spot facility back there, although they do change an incredible amount of wheel sets every year, they can also do any kind of work that needs to be done with, with any kind of car. They can they can do structural work. They can uh, repair air 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 systems, uh, which you know, air brakes on, on on the cars. They can do body work, anything like that. So that's basically like the diesel shop for the cars. I think. Exactly, that's a like like a diesel shop for the cars. They can do just about anything that needs to be done to a car. So what happens when old wheels once you take them off? They get recycled and made into new wheels, or do they just get scrapped? Okay, old. What happens to old wheels? Old wheels uh, normally. Uh, they, they're reforged, so we reuse them. We'll, so we send them from here. You probably, if you travel the interstates a lot, you've probably seen flatbed trailers with tons of rear wheels on them. Oh yeah. We, yeah, they're incredibly expensive just to throw them away once they're, once they're done. So they get reforged, and they get new bearings put in, and they are basically they're rebuilt, and they come back here. Now the wheels on a locomotive, they'll oftentimes they'll they'll they'll, they'll put them through a trim machine at the diesel shop, and they'll bake them round again. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times what happens, with, you know, when you have steel wheels on steel rails, a lot of times what happens is those wheels get a little bit out of round. They're just traveling and traveling and traveling, and next thing you know, they're almost oval sometimes. And you're in that locomotive and you're literally bouncing around. I mean, it's not fun. So they'll put them on this trim machine, it's just a big grinder, and it'll grind them to the round again. And then they have a certain tolerance to where they can do that so many times before they have to be shipped off. So isn't it with like freight trains, like if you slam it into emergency, can't that be also a cause for making flat spots because the wheels essentially would lock up and then yes. slide against the rail? But putting a train in an emergency will cause flat spots on steel wheels really fast. And isn't it, from what I've heard, isn't it you can't let the flat spot, according to railroad rules anyway, the flat spot can't get any bigger than the size of a credit card? And then, uh, actually, I think it's a little smaller now. I wasn't sure. Yeah, it's like, I, I yeah, heard that from somebody. It's like two inches. Okay, that's tall. probably more accurate. I couldn't remember where I heard that. <coughs> Maybe it's a sign. Yep. Okay. So, we were talking a little bit earlier about what, what happens to these manifest yeah. trains when we classify these trains. Um, we utilize the hump system. And what the oh, hump is, it's just, a, it's just a hill. And what we'll do is we'll shove that yeah, train look, up, up, the, top, the, up the, the top of the hill. And once those cars get to That's the top, this is picking up. up to the apex of that hill, there's an electronic board out there that tells the trainman how many cars he needs to send at that particular time. One, two, three, or four cars. So he can either send one car down at a time or a cut of four cars, depending on what they want to do. Or where they're going, if they're all going to the same destination, they'll send all four down. I was going to say, we were out last night at one of the hump hills just watching them. Probably the east. Two at first and then they push another one up and he was sending it to push it yeah. yeah. it, it'll vary, it depends on how they're blocked out and where those cars are going in the train. Because right. what they're doing is they're sending those cars into what they call the bull tracks. And what the bull tracks are, kind of imagine a tree. You got the main trunk, which is the main trunk, or hump track. And as it goes down, it branches out. So the loader. One, one track becomes two, two becomes four, and there's an exponential branch out from there. Over here at the west hump, we have 50 tracks over there where it branches into. The east hump, which is a little bit bigger, we have 64 tracks that it branches into. So each one of those tracks is a destination for us to go to a fueling rack to get refilled. Ah. If they need some maintenance or some inspections done with them, we'll put them on the fuel racks. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the fuel trucks will come out for the switchers. The fuel trucks are also used for what we call distributed power units or DPUs. Oh, if you guys have ever seen the trains where you'll have one or two locomotives in the head end, maybe one or two in the middle, a couple on the end, those those units that are not on the head end are called distributed power units. Oh, okay. Now those are locomotives that the engineer on the head end can control however he wants to. He can do what they, we call put a fence up and he can have those locomotives mirror image everything he's doing on the head end position right here to actually get a unique view that you don't normally get anyplace else you actually get to see a whole coal train from the top wow that's incredible and this is where we saw big boy last year yep this is where he came in last year <laughs> look right there yeah that gives a good example of just how big this place is yeah and holy if you're smokes a trainman, like i am by craft you walked every inch of this place <laughs> <laughs> you definitely got your steps in 
Well, I think it's actually it's, it's uh, the, the original land grant for Union Pacific for Bailey Yard was actually quite a bit bigger than it is now. I always think it's funny so how it's there's actually little got, signs and, and, and I think track, technically, and it's like, it's like it, why are you still close probably old, close to more flat? And, yeah, if you're uh, close enough to read this, throw that train into emergency and stop. It's just that the, the, what we need to use your brand new Silverado for 90 days so they can replace a bolt. Yeah. yeah. You'd be a little upset too. Well, when you pay two and a half billion dollars for a locomotive, and then you have to send it away for 90 days so they can change a screw, you know, that kind of irritates you a little bit. Just a little. So, General Electric at the time built this building up here to do that warranty work and warranty maintenance work and basically cut that from 90 plus days down to just a couple of days in the last of So this it is, is still unbelievable. An today. I'm getting all kinds of good. Wow. I'll be trimming it up, of course. Different areas. Yes. You said it's known by something else by the local. Correct. I did, I did say that, but I just didn't tell you what it was. Oh. <laughs> yeah, what is it? That, well, the common name for that wheel defect detector is uh, we, we affectionately call it the crack house. Oh. <laughs> now, luckily, uh, unfortunately, last year I had a couple that was on here that really took that to be literally. Oh, really? And they had some pretty pointed, pointed oh, questions about what they sell in the crack house. Oh. And, 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 they were something, and, you know, I, I, I kind of had to come down to the point where I told them, I don't think crack house means what you think it means. So, and I think it just clicks for me what you mean by that, because they find the cracks in the wheels. Correct. <laughs> it took me a few seconds to figure that one out after you said it. I'm like, yeah, oh, you guys are supposed you to see the Area 51 now. Now the guys in black are going to have to come talk to y'all. <laughs> I remember this from yeah, last look, year. Look. Please look into this device here. This classy thing. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I remember this from last year. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You know what? My story hasn't changed either. All right. Let's see. If, I'll uh, compare area, it to area the footage from last year. Um, the official uh, reason we call this Area 51 is because uh, there was a day, and I don't know exactly when this was, but I can imagine yeah. it was probably about 2005 or 6. Uh, we were able to process 51 coal trains uh, in one day through this facility. Wow! That's the official position. Look at that. That's the whole story, and they're sticking to it. It's, it's like a service. Well, those of us that work in this yard have There's some service, there's some service units that working there. there. Working on the switches. There's a front motor moving. Anyhow, motor. Area 51, this is what that building right there is where uh, basically all your managers to this facility, uh, their office is at. You have your yard masters in there. Yard master, he or she is in charge of all movement in this that. in this particular yard. Here. Working on switches, uh, so nothing moves without them giving the approval to it. So that's basically where the head honcho sits to yeah, manage this whole honcho. place. As a trainman, you really want to stay out of that place. Yeah, if you go <laughs> but, in there, you might have but, some uh, explaining. But just like the Area 51, you know, and the, that doesn't exist in the Nevada desert, there's a lot of strange things that may or may not happen in that building especially decisions that are made that we just kind of fight the question about. That's, that's the unofficial version of it. That's the principal's so, office. So if you were <laughs> I like that. The principal's office on the train yard. You'd go home. Yeah, I, I, I call in sick and sound. <laughs> okay, now if... They get a remote. Who's that? That was cool. I'm going to have to just trim, I'm gonna have to trim this off. That's easy enough to do anyway. And then trim it up as necessary. I'll probably be doing this for the next few hours. I'll probably be up late tonight working on it. Okay, now look it up. Uh, a big, uh, a huge safety factor for your train crews, and actually not even just your train crews, but all railroad workers that work out in the field. If you look up here to your right, you, you probably see these all over the yard so far. Little stands, they have a little flag on there, it says safety first, maybe a, a light up there, that, and a little yellow thing next to the track. Well, that, that yellow thing is called a derail. Once you throw that handle, that thing pops up on top of the track, and it's got a little angle to it. So if any locomotive or car happens to come through there, it hits that, it diverts it off the track and puts it to dirt to stop the car from going any further. Isn't That's, it? Uh, we use those if you have uh, men, men or, or, or women working on our equipment, like at this uh, fueling facility over here at the West Run Through. If they're working in there, they'll throw these derails up. So if anything happens to come in there while they're in between cars 
or, or under or under locomotives or under cars, they don't come in and actually and, and actually tie on a, a couple of those cars. So that protects the. And isn't it if you hit one of the? But isn't it those derailers only work at slow speeds? Because isn't it if you hit one at a high enough speed, it'll essentially break. It'll essentially shatter it. It's, it's possible, but we do. We have high speed derails that take care of that too. Really? There's no reason for anything to be tra traveling here fast enough to, to break the car. So there's such a thing as a specialized high speed derailleur that can deal yeah, with higher what speed. What it is is a track that just goes off to, from one track to the other, it goes to nothing. Oh. So you're just diverted off a track that ends. Switch to actually, nowhere. Well, you won't see huh. it, but we actually have one on the other side of the hill over here. Oh, I didn't know that. No. So what does it take to get a look at Okay, excellent question. What does it take to get a locomotive on a track after it goes over one of those derails? We have two really big guys out here. And they, you know, Doesn't it? No. That's all they do. That's all they do. They sit in the building over there, they lift weights, and they wait for a locomotive to fall off the track. Now, we, uh, we, we do have a crane out here, uh, or actually a couple of them that are called a Manus. A uh, huge. Very heavy, uh, heavy duty, heavy weight cranes. It can and will pick up a locomotive. Aren't those? Aren't there two cranes at the other end of the yard, over near the East Bowl? East Town there, there might be. They're, they're usually parked over there someplace. I was gonna say I've seen two cranes facing each other with their booms crossed. There's like two small cranes sitting over there. Are those what they use for picking up the engines? It, 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 if that's the manus, yeah, their their booms fold over like three sections. I think that's so what I'm thinking of then. I think that is the ones that I've seen from the Golden Spike. I think. But yeah, we'll, we'll use those manuses to put, put cars and put uh, locomotives back on the, on the rail if need be. It's got to be a pretty strong crane to pick up a locomotive considering how heavy they are. <laughs> wow, look at that. This has been... Yes, yes, the, this, uh, this train that you see off to your right that's coming back, coming back in the yard, uh, that's one of our irritable trains. Now those those containers you see, you've probably seen them on ships before. And trucks. Okay, that's exactly where they are. They go from ships to rail to oftentimes trucks, and then to wherever they go after that. But that's that's a business that we're actually picking up a little bit here. So it's we're picking that business up a little bit. Oh, now that we're going back over the top, this camera's going to get a good sight of that view. Yes. It's like I grew up in Miami, Florida. This is this going really well. Wasn't there an incident with an auto rack with a that caught fire car that was carrying a bunch of Teslas recently? Yeah, last year, year that we had a we, we had something like that happen here. Yeah, I remember seeing the actual burned out car from the Golden Spike. See it on the yard. That is just okay. That is a view to remember. Actually, that derail, the high speed derail, is right down here. Yes, sir. How does the decoupling work without the hump? How do you actually get into the cars? How, do, how does the decoupling work? Or uncoupling? The, uh, between the cars, okay, you have like a coupling system. It's, yeah. it's called a coupling. Yeah, we, yeah, once, once the That's pressure's cool. been yeah. released on that car, which we, we hit the apex, the locomotive okay. is also pulling those pins. Now, are there remote and all weather. On some trains you'll see they also have a system where they can uncouple yes. the cab. We, this the whole, all the switch yards in this yard are trains, so you don't see that on train trains with this. So if you look around, if you see blinking lights, the yellow lights or orange lights on top of the locomotive, that's a remote control locomotive. Now there's a, there may or may not be a, a, an operator on the locomotive itself. Okay, that operator can be as far as two miles away from that locomotive and still control it. So, so that, that way that, because these, these trains are getting up over here at the East Hub, okay, that, that remote control locomotive is about a mile and a half, two miles down this way. Uh, oh, look at that. On the, on the west end of these trains. Yeah. 
Track the crane. guy who's controlling is the... That's one, one of those rail cranes. I saw that one earlier. He's shoving those cars towards him. Yeah, he's got that little grabber. He's trying to... It's like a little claw game. Exactly. Do you see what he's trying to... He's controlling all the movement. He's trying to grab it. Baby mom should Yes, ma'am. The guy pulling the pin spends all day stepping up and over the rail, or does he have a... Or some no, he he, he just sits on he walks on a pathway, just makes a little loop, about a four car loop, and depending on how many cars he he needs to let down at the time, he'll either let one at a time, two, three, or, or up to four. I think I'm so good. he just he just pin, he just pulls the pin and turns around and walks it walks back. But and he'll he'll look at a board. There's a there's a dashboard up there. It'll tell him what his next cut's going to be, how many cars there is. The brake lines that are good. They automatically on the brake lines also automatically. Yeah, the brake lines are just little uh, angle cut or uh, glad hands. Hand. They'll just pop right off. And when they get under a certain amount of pressure, they'll just separate. Yep. And you know, with the glad hands as well, you're not supposed to uncouple them when they're under pressure. Because if you pop the glad hands apart while they're under pressure, there there's enough force behind them with the yeah, air. So once those trains are, all these trains over here that you hurt. see on your right hand side. Those are all trains getting ready to go over these humps sometime today. Yeah, if you're up in the Golden Spike, if you look past the East Hump Hill, you can see this yard. Here's here our fuel trucks we were discussing earlier. These fuel trucks, they, they, they refuel a lot of our switchers, and they, they fuel most of our DPUs that are out there. This is the rack, this is where they get their fuel from, is this rack off to the right here. So you had said that the fuel comes into this giant white tank, and then whatever, and then it gets transferred into that blue tank, and whatever's in that blue tank is used for filling up stuff throughout the, from the tanker trucks. Yeah, that's for that's where the fuel's drawn from. Okay. This is a reserve tank. That's so the there's the so the the big, so that's the emergency reserve tank, the big white one or the blue one. The white one. The white one. Got it. So basically, if you're running low, you'd switch over from the blue tank to the white tank, and then you'd have enough fuel for maybe a day or so, probably. I couldn't tell you how long it lasts. Probably goes down pretty quick. I, I, I do know that years ago, we used to refill that blue one up every day. Oh, jeez. Oh, wow. so, that wouldn't last yeah, too long when, now. When, when we were running lots of coal through here about uh, 2005, 6, 7, like that, we were refilling that thing every day. Oh, it's a two million gallon One's a little more, one's a little less. It's kind of like it's basically the combination of the two tanks we see at North Bay. Like one and a half million and a half million. I have been for the past several years working yeah, with the what we call beer trainers. I helped train, help train new hires. Uh, I show them it's a jet engine on wheels that we truck. can run over switches and it yep, generates going heat under the hump. lots of thrust. There's the tower. Blow snow and ice out of the out of switches. So it's basically like and a glorified And then we have great new trainmen, new hires and stuff with brooms. We've <laughs> got those guys too. And so essentially... So th this is where seniority really plays a part in what we do out here. Oh, that's a, that's a dumpster truck. Oh, they're working on the retarder. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you know how many miles of track you have in the yard? I, miles of track, we have right about uh, 300 miles of track. That was fun. So, and that might that might vary one way or another because we added some track here recently. So I don't know what uh, where they added it and how much they did, but uh, on average, it's close to 300 miles. So you can get yourself from here to Omaha pretty easy on on what we got here at the yard. Okay, now coming up here, we're going to get a good good shot at the bowl. And we'll be able to see some the, the returners. Unfortunately, it looks like they're doing some kind of maintenance up there at the hub, so we're not going to be able to see anything going down. But you'll get a good shot at the bowl and uh, kind of see how the bowl's laid out. And there is a, a set of returners that we did remove last year, so you actually get a, get real close to see how those things operate. And like I said, they're just like a big pair of pliers. Too bad we're not going to be able to hear it because I think you guys would really enjoy that. So, isn't it for the bowl? It's not a perfectly flat. The bowl's not perfectly flat. No, it's kind of. It's called a bowl because it's kind of sloped like a big like saucer. A yep. Huh. That way you, you don't have to worry about it rolling out. They'll, they'll always congregate in the center. Okay, that makes sense. How long will the set of the last? So here's the like retarder modules. Uh, Actually, these are the first ones I've ever seen replaced. Oh, wow. So, now there's there's rails on there. There's, there's the actual Look at that. Uh, suppressors or brakes. So they replace those quite often, but the actual retarders themselves. Yeah, you can I see think, the springs. Really yeah. 
So basically the retarders... Yeah, these are the retarders here you see on your left hand side. And then the plus yeah. seat ones are right on the other side. There's so, two sets of them. These are what they call uh, the that's primaries. That's cool. Or no, these are the secondaries. The primary that's ones That's really cool what they look like. Behind, this. Uh -huh. the switches, you know that the picture they have painted on the inside that's of the not, tower? That's not electricity. That was the shot the from the top of the east uh, tunnel. Pneumatic. It's all air power. Oh, okay. okay, so needless to say, you can't just go down to... Go down to Menards and buy a 33 gallon air compressor and no. things are going to run these. That's down. not going to work. So, we, we do have, have a special facility for that. And if you look over here on your right, you'll see these, these big blue containers, those blue coils and everything. That building right there is our air compressor. So, this building's a glorified air compressor, basically. The, yeah, the small one, not the big tower here, but the small one. Yeah, wow. Sort of this around, That's insane. I'd always wondered how that worked. Now within in that in this little building over here, this is where our air compressor's at. There's there's uh, four great big diesel engines in there. That's so all they do is generate air. Wow. So does that compressor supply for both humps or just the east? Just the east hump. So the west there's hump's one just like it for the west. So the west hump's got its own. Yep. Yeah. And I do recommend that you do not fill your truck tire up with this. this oh place. geez, I think you'll blow your truck tire your, up your, in about half a second. Your road hazard will uh, coverage will not cover. It. I promise you. Don't ask me how I know this. So basically, if you <laughs> tried, oh. You guys are here working. Where are you going for your break? We have crew it, within the, within this yard. There's seven crew rooms. Oh. Uh, within within Bailey Yard is actually broken into seven yards. So there's seven oh. smaller yards in here. Each yard has its own separate uh, uh, job that it does. Together with all those yards doing their own their own separate piece of that puzzle. We're able to build trains the way we do and, and as fast as proficiently as well. So each one of those has its own crew room where when, once it's time to, to, to go to lunch or if it's, uh, you need to take a break from the weather or whatever the case is or get more paperwork for your next train, that's where you go. Oh geez, there's something firing up over in the fuel over in the rack. Holy crap, that thing's just chugging smoke. Holy smokes. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of our pollution control vehicles. What on earth? Oh my gosh! That thing's just belching smoke. So, look over here. I want you to yes. look at well, the welders and see that little Kubota with the high yeah, There used to be a little uh, observation tower over here someplace. Yeah, they, yeah there, there was one there when I first hired on. And, uh, it's awesome. About eight or ten years ago, they finally collapsed on itself or something. We decided it's probably the best time to use it.
I think this is just really cool. Ooh, big water tower. <laughs> it's got a smiley on it. Yeah, I love that. That's oh, here great. comes something. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's an interesting configuration with the Chinese looking ends. Yeah. Well, maybe it's Japan where the ends come up. Yeah, but look what well, actually looks like. They modeled that one so it looks like it's been damaged because if you look at the containers. Yeah. Here's, a, here's another one too that's kind of Yeah. Cool. That's kind of cool. It's kind of, that's really creative. <laughs> I love this, how they did the, how they did the silos using old tin cans. That's genius. That's some ingenious recycling. Bigger stuff running over there. Nice passenger cars. Train car with a service car next to it. Cleaning up something happened there. Looks like a car split a switch. So here's one of those loaders. Those big cranes. Well, that's actually a forklift. See the big forklift back there? And there's a tiny one, and then the One Network Express car. Or Ocean yeah. Network Express. Gentleman over here has one of these that is the picker. Uh, to is pick picker. them up? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, he's got one over there to sell. I'll have to go take this a look at that. This one we can make it into, but we don't have the bracket that goes yeah. to go over the top. Yeah. I've seen those in action in person, though. Oh, yes. A big container lifter. Those are cool. This is an area that one of our guys, he won his module. Yeah, okay, this is how they do it. So, yeah. Oh, look at that, a little airfield. It's an expensive way to buy hay. Oh my god, what was that? Look at the airfield, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I thought they had enough land <laughs> to grow their own. Well, I would have thought so. Oh, look at that, the observatory. Ooh, I didn't see that the first time we came around. Well, we, were, we came around over there. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. This is so cool. It's kind of like how we did it last year when I got the videos for last year's. I really like how they painted that with the one blade that's yellow. <laughs> Look at that big grain silo building. It's a farmer's, farmer's elevator. Oh, that's cool. back there and here's that bridge again that they can flip up that's that's ingenious if you ask me and they got it the tolerance is right so it's tiny little gaps between yeah. the rails